Oh, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings you give us and for the rain that you're sending us. We pray that you will guide us now and be with us in all that we do this day. And pray that you be with our services. Pray that you will be with our missionary of the work, Joyce Bowman, with, with uh, her health problems and with all the things that she is doing to further your word, Lord. Pray that you will bring great uh, harvest to her work there and pray that you will be with her and give her your blessings and comfort. Pray that you'll be with those that are having physical problems. They might, You might put your hand upon them. Pray that you'll be with the pastor now. He's down this morning and having the flu and pray that you will touch his life and give him healing. Pray that you'll give me strength this week as I go to Mayo's and have my knee replaced and pray that you will put your blessings on us and pray that you will be with the, our country that we might have revival in this country that we might come back to the ways of putting you in first in things that we might not be going further and further away from you pray that you will bless the rest of our service now in Jesus name amen Blessing on the, the Oh, right. Okay. I'm getting, I'll get through right here for a second. Uh, the announcements. Uh, well, a ladies' meeting, you can read it over there, 21st of February. And the March 3rd, uh, and we have a missionary conference it's listed there of all three missionaries that will be here. <coughs> And I believe we're having a yeah an afternoon service that day, and then the March 14th blood drive. Now we haven't, as this group up here haven't determined where that's at, but I don't know whether it's supposed to be at the church or where it's supposed to be. Do you know, Tammy, anything about that? Yeah, here. Okay, so get your blood all pumped up and you take your vitamins so you can take your blood. I believe unless somebody else has a. A announcement that will take care of the announcements. Um, let's uh, worship with our offering now. And oh, Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this. What you do for us and the how you supply us with the means that we need, and we pray that we might remember to share with you, back to you, what you have given us, because it's all yours, and you only expect part of it back. In Jesus' name, amen. Our psalm of praise today is 90, Psalm 96, 7 through 13. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The word also shall be established that shall not move, be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein, and shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the earth with righteousness and the people with his truth.
Well, good morning. Pastor asked me to uh, do a review of last week. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to review last week since I weren't here, <laughs> but uh, the subject matter I'm aware of. But anyway, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing how the Lord works things out. And as we studied Noah, uh, or Jonah last week, uh, and I read the first chapter this morning, realized that God's sovereignty is amazing, amazing. Even in the Old Testament, how God orchestrated events in a person's life. And we saw that in, in, uh, with Nineveh and Jonah. And, uh, well, he kind of did that this week because we were planning on stopping on, in two different locations on our way back from uh, my brother's house in Tallahassee. But we had not an, announced the, to them that we were coming. It was just a possibility. We, if we had time, we would pass by and stop in to see them. Uh, that would be uh, yesterday in uh, afternoon. And, uh, but as we got traveling, we thought, oh my, we've been gone a long time. Uh, we sure be nice to get back in our own bed. <laughs> and uh, as time went on, we thought, well, m goodness, maybe we ought to just go on home. And so, well, Let's go halfway, and we got up uh, to the border of Tennessee and Alabama, and it got late, so we stopped that night. And the next day, I said, well, should we go over towards St. Louis or should we not? And as we got up to Nashville and uh, on our way up and got to a point where we had to decide, so said, oh, let's just go on home. And so we said, well, if it runs out of time, we get too tired, we'll stop on our way Saturday night. Well, we got too close to stop, okay? <laughs> and we said, oh, let's just go on home. But uh, Pastor Call uh, emailed me this week and said, asked me when we was going to come home, and I didn't think too much about it. I thought, well, you know, he's just curious and interested in when we're coming. I didn't know he was sick, <laughs> and he didn't say he was sick. And so when I read the uh, the devotion, the daily devotions this morning, it said, please pray for me because I'm not really feeling very good and I don't know how I'm going to do this uh, message this morning. I immediately called him and told him, wow, why didn't you say something? Because uh, we definitely could have been here. Well, we are here. See how the Lord works things out? <laughs> and uh, so we're grateful for that and we're grateful for your prayers. But when we think about Jonah, and, uh, and I'm sure the pastor mentioned this last week, how God's mercy and God's grace is so wonderful. And we, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, always thought that, that God's mercy and God's grace was only for them. And to see that God's blessing could be upon a heathen nation, a godless person, a nation, a godless town, a town that was so wicked that God was going to destroy it unless they repented. It was hard for Jonah and the Israelites and the Hebrew people to understand that. And sometimes we have a hard time realizing that sometimes God uses other people in our lives when he wants to rattle our chain, okay, and make ourselves miserable until we realize that we've created our own misery until we repent and say, yes, Lord, I'm sorry, we, we're down on the wrong, we're on the wrong road, and we turn around. And so I believe that's more or less the, the essence of last year, week's sermon. That's what I got out of it. I wondered if anybody else got anything else out of it. <laughs> Larry. The, the hostage boy, yeah. yes, that's that's probably true, and uh, that was a, a story of this week, yeah, grateful that he was able to get released, and it just shows what the, what evil, I, I was thinking not too long ago on a number of occasions, what, what the Bible says about the heart, it says the heart is desperately wicked, who can know it, remember that scripture verse? And I remember uh, uh, 
evangelist one time says, well, you know, there's not one horrible, heinous sin that can be committed by man that you are not capable of doing it under certain circumstances if you're away from God and in the evil heart. And so we have to guard our hearts against evil. What did Jonah have to guard his heart about? Obedience. Obedience. He wasn't really willing to do that, was he? And so, uh, Jonah, there's several miracles here. I want to just kind of share them with you. God performed several miracles in chapter 1. First miracle was the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. In other words, the storm that was created in the sea was not a normal storm, okay? It was so severe, the mariners had never seen it before. And so that was a miracle. A miracle is something that's against nature, against normal things, okay? The second miracle, uh, when they did the lots, the lot fell on Jonah. Now, this is kind of like God's sovereignty, right? The lot that they say, well, who, who's responsible for this terrible thing? And they cried to their gods, and their gods didn't answer. They said, well, how come you're not calling on your God? Who are you? They asked the Jonah. And so they said, well, we've got to find out who's responsible. They threw the lots, whatever they were, however they did it. I'm not sure how they did it. But lot fell on Jonah. You think God had any direction in that? Absolutely. So that was another one. The sea ceased from the raging as soon as what? What stopped the raging sea? Jonah in the water. Okay. And the other miracle is what? God provided a salvation for Jonah in a great big monster, sea monster, whatever you want to call it. To, he provided uh, a sea monster to swallow up Jonah. That was another miracle. So we see miracles in, in Jonah chapter 1. We see God's sovereignty in chapter 1. We see God's mercy in chapter 1. And I thought to this the morning when I was reading this, did the Ninevites deserve God's mercy? Do we deserve God's mercy? Absolutely not. And so we want to praise God today for his mercy and his goodness to us. And so we're going to continue on in the service today with our singing. Please take your hymn and let's turn to number 54. How wonderful art thou. You know, many times uh, in our lives we... Even though we're Christians, um, some of us are, well, I hope us, all of us are here, but how many times have you rejected uh, what God has told you to do? Probably, like me, lots of times. Um, but yet, uh, God uh, prods us along, and he continues to work on us, and he shows us his mercy. And... This song here, How Wonderful Art Thou, uh, really kind of describes uh, the situation. Uh, he is so wonderful and so kind and loving. Let's sing uh, all three here.
Romans 11, 31 through 36. Even so have these also not known believed, that, thou, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Number 156. You can stand with me, please. How can it be? How can it be that God should love a soul like me? Oh, how can it be? He's trying to get a point across there. Let's sing all three, please. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. And thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me unto the deep, and the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to thy soul. The depth flows me round about, the weeds were wrapped upon my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet, how, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I'm sure that Jonah probably after he was out on the ground probably sang this song that we're going to sing 153 he is able to deliver thee
30. Lord, I need you. We definitely need the Lord. pray. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that you will be with the pastor as he brings the message now, and pray that you will open our minds and help us to come to an understanding of your word that we might be able to win souls for you this, this day and uh, on into the future. Pray that you will guide us and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to you all. I appreciate everyone filling in for me, and I thought I'd wait to come over so I don't get everybody else this lovely whatever this is. But uh, I'm glad that you're here today, and uh, I hope you'll bear with me, and I hope I don't start to coughing on you, and if I do, I'm sorry. And if I look like I'm in pain, it, I am. Uh, I think I've bruised my ribs or something coughing, and so it hurts pretty bad every time I cough. Feels like someone's jabbing with me a knife in my my rib cage. So, bear with me today, and uh, we'll get through this. This will probably be one of my shortest messages in about ten years. So, you can write that down on uh, the blessing side of things. Uh, enjoyed uh, Dale's review. Did a great job for not being here. Uh, <laughs> That was very good. Glad to see the Mayfields back, and and uh, do appreciate everyone filling in for me while I've uh, been away today here. Um, <clears throat> Jonah is, uh, as we mentioned last time, uh, an amazing story, and and one of the things that's interesting is how many people tried to deny that this story is actually true. A lot of people look at this story as an allegory, and uh, that's just simply a example of God's salvation, that it's not really God 
working like this in a fish with, a, with Jonah, but instead it's just somebody making a nice story for us to think about that. Uh, the, there's a few problems with that. I think the, the biggest one is that Christ used this story of Jonah and him being in a fish for three days to be part of the reasoning for his, or not reasoning, but kind of likeness of him uh, spending three days in the grave. And in Matthew chapter 12, it says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So Christ is really using that to show his own uh, rejection that people had towards him, even though he was a much greater sign than Jonah was. And um, there's a lot of different uh, thinking on Jonah. Some people believe that uh, part of the reason that the Ninevites had an easy time to believe and understand was because of the story of Jonah. And it's possible that some people believe that the stomach acid of the fish would have caused some permanent or, or at least semi-permanent uh, bleaching of his skin and caused him to be kind of a white ghost-like uh, looking guy. And I don't know if all that is true or not, but uh, there was even stories uh, told of other people being swallowed by a fish and living and uh, it's interesting to, to think about. But the, the amazing thing here is that we know that because we believe in the Bible, that this story is true. And uh, we can have faith that uh, Jonah somehow um, was found by that fish because God appointed it, as, as Dale said here today, just the sovereignty of God is amazing to see there. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other stories that are a lot more difficult to, to believe in the Bible. Uh, the virgin birth, <laughs> we accept by faith. Uh, there's a lot of other doctrines of the God's word that we just accept and we believe. And uh, the book, the story of Jonah, I think, is one of those that we have to believe and accept by faith that this did happen, that God did send a fish to catch a man. Kind of opposite of what we do today, right? Where we send a man to catch a fish. Um, but um, you guys didn't catch my punt in my little joke there. I think I'm off. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. So as we come to chapter 2, though, of the book, we'll see Jonah pray to God in thanksgiving for his deliverance. And we'll continue to see God's mercy even through this prayer. And remember that Jonah prayed this prayer while he was in the fish. This wasn't once he was up on the shore and that he knew he was going to be okay. But instead, as you look at verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry, the dry land. So this prayer happened before that happened. So Jonah is praying this prayer inside the fish before he knew that he was going to be vomited up on dry ground and that he, he knew for sure that he was going to be okay. Now I think we can see through this prayer that he believed in faith that God had a plan to save him and that God was going to, to let him loose, but uh, it didn't happen until after the prayer was done. So I want to look at this. First off... Um, Let's read through the first four verses here. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord of my, out of my distress, and he answered me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep and into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet again I shall look, uh, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple." So we see here, the first point I want to make is that God's mercy is seen in hearing our prayer no matter where we are. Um, even when we don't call upon him until we are in distress. Remember that we said last time that Jonah was running from God. But Jonah, knowing what Jonah knew of God, why did he decide that was the best plan? Why did Jonah decide it was the best idea for him to run? Well, after... And then after he was running from God, he got on the boat and the storm came. Why not repent then? Instead of telling the, the mariners to throw him overboard, why didn't he tell those sailors to, to wait while he repented and turn back to God and turn the boat around and go back to shore so he could do what he wanted to do? 
instead of telling, instead of doing all that, he, he said, throw me overboard. It's interesting to think about it, and I'm not sure we really have an answer besides the fact that Jonah wasn't done running. And that's my point. God is ready to hear our prayer no matter where we are, no matter how much we have run from him. That's a merciful God. The Israelites experienced that again and again throughout their history, where they would run from God, God would chastise them, they would rebel against that chastisement, and eventually they'd get tired of the chastisement and come back to God. And God mercifully would forgive them. I think the psalmist in Psalm 107 captures that thought very well. <clears throat> it says in, in verse 10, Some sat in darkness and in the shadows of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of their darkness of the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. You see, God in his mercy looked upon the children of Israel when they were being punished, when they were being carried off, and I think that has a lot to do with the uh, times of the judges where people would be raised up against Israel to, to really chastise them. And God again and again would show his mercy and hear their prayer. That's God, and, and that's what God is in his mercy. He does the same thing to us. When we cry out to him, no matter if it takes us being in distress to call to him, he is ready to hear us, no matter if it's when we're in the belly of a great fish, as in the case of Jonah. And that's amazing. And, and it, even more amazing, you see there in verse 3 again, for you, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and all your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. And here's my point is that God is merciful enough to hear us even when we're, we're in distress because of his punishment. Notice that Jonah acknowledges why it is that he was in the deep. Why is it he was in the heart of the sea? He knows that God had placed him there. Jonah says he was driven away from God's sight. What's interesting is that Jonah could not go anywhere that would be out of God's sight. And the only reason he was in this position was because he was running from God. But I'm guessing he's referring to the fact that he found himself headed to the bottom of the sea. But even in the midst of this, Jonah finds hope that he will be, again be able to pray to his God. Jonah knew that this fish was an instrument of God's mercy, just as the storm was an instrument of God's judgment. But what i really like to stress today is just how amazing it is that God will have mercy upon those who he is punishing. Think about that. A holy God sees Jonah rebel against him and his plan, and he sees Jonah go overboard, and he sends a fish out of mercy, and he hears Jonah's cry. Amazing. I think there's a correlation to parenting here. How many of you have a hard time disciplining your child because you feel bad when they begin to cry? I'll admit at times I have a hard time with that. I'm kind of the merciful one in our house. That's honest, right, hon? Yeah. And I don't like to see my little girls cry. I don't like to see them sad. Um... But even though that's true, there are times when I am disciplining them that they can cry all they want because, you know what, they have done wrong and I need to get their attention. How many parents have been in that spot before? You with me? All right. That happens. When children have parents, though, that will never punish them because they don't want to hurt their feelings, um, the result is not good. And... and you watch out in society today, you can see that happen all the time, where parents don't want to discipline their child because they don't want to see their child have hurt feelings. And even in the Christian school, some of the parents that my wife has the pleasure of dealing with that have that attitude towards their kids, that makes it really hard. It really does. Um, 
On the other hand, when a parent has never has any kind of mercy and has no feelings of compassion to their children when they're disciplining them, that's also a bad situation. And I've seen uh, from both sides of, of that on, uh, in homes, and neither one is good. But here we see the perfect balance from our Heavenly Father. God was definitely punishing Jonah. God was chastening Jonah because Jonah had done wrong. He had rebelled against God way, God's ways and God's plan. And he was directly being disobedient to what God told him to do. There's no doubt about that. But even in the midst of that chastening, Jonah was able to call out to God, and God heard him. That's amazing. God didn't just let him go to the bottom of the sea and say, all right, next prophet, step up, let's go. You're going to Nineveh. God didn't do that. God saw Jonah, and, and he saw Jonah headed to the bottom of the sea and said, I'm going to save him with a fish. And he was willing to work with Jonah to see that his heart was changed. That is real mercy. And we'll see in the next few verses that the timing of God's rescuing Jonah is also very important. Just as with us with parenting, the timing of when you turn from discipline to comfort is very vital. So it is with God's mercy here that we can see that he knew exactly when to show that mercy to Jonah. And we see in verse 5, The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me out of my, up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Jonah's description there in these few verses is pretty stunning when you think about it, and really scary actually. If you can imagine his feelings as he was going through that. He's describing his plummeting to the bottom of the Mediterranean seafloor. He's even beginning to see the, the mountains underneath the water. He's feeling the seaweed all around him. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be pretty scared at that point. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for Jonah? To feel like this was it. But notice the end of verse 6, yet you brought up my life from the pit. Just as Jonah was thinking that death was coming his way very quickly, it was at that very moment when he, he probably called out for God. We don't have that recorded here, but it seems as though that's the case. And God rescued him with that great big fish. And as we see in verse 7, this rescuing came when Jonah called out to God. That is the perfect time when we finally come to see that we need him. It says, when I, my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. To those, those who pray, pay regard <coughs> to vain idols forsake the hope of, their, of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay, salvation belongs to the Lord. God's mercy brings us back to God. That's the point. That's the point of this chapter. Is that we're seeing God's mercy showed in, in the life of Jonah. He's seen it. And it's bringing him back to God. That's why we can say with confidence that even the storm was God's mercy. Because it was the tool that God used to bring Jonah back to, to himself. You see, if I believe that, I believe, or if we believe that having our faith in God, walking in his way is the best place for us to be, then whatever we go through as far as the chastening of God really is his mercy being shown to us. If we are are off the path and we need to be gotten back on the path, even if that means a tragedy in our life, that's merciful. And folks, that's why the, a, a temporal view of life and one that views the, the hardships of life as all bad and the good times as all, only good, and that's the only thing that's good is when my life's going perfectly, we're not really understanding God's mercy. Sometimes the most merciful thing God can do to us is to really wake us up. It's the same thing with our children. 
It's not merciful to never discipline your child because they'll never learn not to do something. Never learn to stop when you say stop so they don't get hit by that car. Never learn to, to not touch something when you say don't touch so they don't burn their hands on the stove. All of these things make sense to us as parents, I hope anyway. But folks, it's the same thing with God. God, sometimes in his mercy, has to bring us to that point where we're in the fish. We're in the storm. And we're finally to the point where we're calling out for God. In Jonah's situation, God could have just as easily tossed him aside. He could have just let him continue on his trip, not cause the storm, let, just let Jonah run from God. That could have been the end of the story. Isn't that something? Same thing with you. The moment that you began to run from God and decide you don't need him, God could just let you go. The fact that you're here today tells me he didn't. That's his mercy. And he does the same thing with us over and over again. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are an illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable, peaceful fruit of righteousness for the, to those who have been trained by it. What a reminder that God disciplines us because he loves us. God brought this into Jonah's life, the storm, the being cast over, the fish, because he loved Jonah. He had a plan for Jonah. And it may seem painful for a moment, but in the end it brings us where we need to be. And it did with Jonah. We see a complete attitude change in Jonah from running to God to calling out to God. Amazing. And he also notices, you see there when we read verse 8, that he, believe, he sees how empty it is to believe in those vain idols. Uh, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What an amazing contrast there that he shows us. Those who pay regard to the idols, they forget it. They, they can just forget about that steadfast love that God offers. What love can an idol give? Especially compared to the love that a merciful God does give. And Jonah had experienced that. He had seen the steadfast love firsthand when he thought all was lost. And some people believe that Jonah is referring to the idols of the, of the sailors who had thrown him overboard. As they were praying to their idols, they told him to pray to his God. And so some people believe that's what he's talking about here. That's what he's referring to. <coughs> it's possible that Jonah was thinking here how silly it was of those mariners to even think that their gods could do anything. It was obvious to him that he served the one true God who would show his steadfast love. And what's also interesting, if you remember last week, we saw that at the end of that chapter that God did show his steadfast love and his mercy to those sailors even, that they turned to him and offered sacrifice and prayed vows to God. Amazing. And it's interesting that that's what Jonah does here also. Look at verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. That was the same response to the mercy of God that the sailors had in chapter 1 which maybe tells us we should have that same response when we experience the mercy of God. Probably. So what did, what did Jonah vow when he said, what I have vowed I will vow? I think it had something to do with Nineveh? I don't know. I mean, we're just guessing here. But probably since he decided to go there. 
<clears throat> but notice his last statement in the fish is simple, yet so amazing. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He knew it. Jonah was proof that salvation belonged to the Lord. Jonah was, was on his way to be dead. He knew it. He knew that God had saved him. But did he accept it when he came to the people of Nineveh? Did he accept the fact that God was the author of salvation for those people also? And that we'll see next week, that he had a hard time with that. And although Jonah was speaking of salvation from death at the bottom of the sea, we know that our salvation from eternal death also belongs to the Lord. And we can be thankful and praise God for his salvation today. And we see there, verse 10, the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So folks, I want to encourage you with that thought, that God is a merciful God. No matter where we are, no matter if we're feeling his chastisement right now, that doesn't mean God's done with you. No matter if you feel like you're very far away from God right now, as Jonah did heading to the bottom of the ocean, God is still ready to show you mercy. That's amazing. And I hope that you will be encouraged by that today and really think about and contemplate God's wonderful mercy to your own, your own spot. And if you have not experienced that salvation that belongs to the Lord, not salvation based on your own good works, but salvation that belongs to the Lord, that salvation that the Bible tells us is <clears throat> based on what Jesus Christ has done for us, dying on the cross for us, forgiving our sins, that we need to call out to him and seek that forgiveness. I hope you'll contemplate that today and even talk to somebody about that today. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this prayer of Jonah that reminds us of your great mercy. Lord, we thank you for the mercy you showed to Jonah. We thank you that you want to show us the same mercy today. We thank you for the salvation you gave to, to Jonah. We thank you for the salvation you provide for us today. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that has not accepted your gift of salvation, that today they would call out to you in faith, believing that what you have done on the cross is for them, that they would accept that free gift. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, that you're that great and gracious God. We pray things in your name. Amen. <clears throat> and ask Chris and Mitch to come. We'll close in a song here. Four hundred and thirty. I'm going to sing that one more time. Just the first verse. Just that reminder that we need God. Sometimes, like Jonah, <coughs> we get to that spot where we don't think we need God. We can go our own direction. And sometimes that's with salvation. Sometimes that's with our direction of our life. We begin to think that we've got it figured out, that we know better than God does. But we need to have this prayer. Lord, I need you. Begins with salvation. Continues on with our life. Let's stand as we sing 430. Sometimes when life seems
thank you for being here this morning, and and uh, I think Brother Dale's going to take tonight for me and share, share something with you, and appreciate him doing that, and uh, be praying for me that I get to feeling better. I hope no one else any more time. Mitch, I really feel bad now. I understand what you're dealing with. I understand what you're dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate your prayers, and, and um, thanks for being patient with me today, and um, I hope you have a great afternoon. Stay healthy. And, uh, you know, all week I was thinking about this message, and I didn't have it as bad as Jonah. I wasn't in a fish, so it's all relative. Um, anyway, but uh, thanks for being here today, and hope to see you on Wednesday night. All right, let's bow in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy. Uh, just amazing to see. And Lord, we help us to really recognize it in our own lives and to praise you for it. We praise things in your name. Amen. Have a good day.